Hello, everyone. My name is Tans Herman. And I'm Art Carmichael. We're here on behalf of the Grassland Coalition and trying to discuss some topics important to many ranchers throughout the state regarding the topic of drought. Um, things are dry. If we don't see very normal conditions returning or even above normal as far as precipitation is concerned very soon, most folks are going to be facing forage shortages moving into this growing season. And we want to walk through some questions that, that many of you are probably asking yourselves. Mark, my first question to you, uh, and actually kind of even starts with a statement, I'd like you to talk to the ranchers out there uh, that are out of grass. We're already in spring, things are starting to green up, at least some of the early cool season grasses, um, and, and they recognize that boy, forage is going to be short this year. They may have already taken some action, but, but let's presume they haven't. They're sitting on their cow herd. What first steps, what advice do you have for, for that type of person? Well, first steps is, you know, find uh, that core that you need to keep or you want to keep, or, or maybe it's, you know, if you want to get rid of everything, it'd be uh, established that, that uh, the levels there, you know, what, what, what you're willing to do and what you're willing not to do. Because feeding your way through can get very, very expensive and we don't know when it's going to end or when, you know, so it'd be uh, trying to get a plan together so it's not just on emotion, so it's, it's set out before you. That way you can start taking action mm -hmm. without having so much emotion into it. You know, and, and whether that's, uh, I don't want to say that, it's, uh, you know, if, if you just totally need to, need to sell out, then, then you need to make a plan for that, a marketing plan for that. And if it's that you want to keep that herd, but you need to forage, so we need to find an alternative forage source or somewhere else to send them if we can, you know, mm -hmm. but we need to make that plan right now you know it, it will rain here someday yeah but this season it will rain somewhere and hopefully not too far away even right. if it's not yeah. here yeah. so that may be an option yeah. that's a good point yeah bart i hope you'd tell the story of how and and roughly when this ranch recognized that you needed to do something to address drought because it's a normal part of our ecosystem right it, it happens on a somewhat regular basis yeah, I wouldn't. You just don't know when. I wasn't even in business very long when we realized that, you know, because I mean, it's we have a your stocking rate that when I started, you know, what your neighbors tell you, what you know, what your area tells you, what Grandpa always run, and but it didn't take very long at all to realize that you needed to have a drought plan of some sorts, and a lot of times it it used to come down to, and you, and you hear this a lot. Well, I can graze my hay ground, you know, that was that was kind of the drought plan. Um, so, and then the further we got into it, into the managed grazing actually made it more of a, a definite because there was, we were clipping and weighing forage and we knew what we were using. We knew what we were harvesting, you know, and, and then them telltale signs come about and, but drought is actually what really threw us into the management grazing too as well. Because we could allocate so many days of grass, you know, for the cow herd, and then it had all the rest of time to come off, and and then when it did get a rain, it would respond from, you know, because it had urine and feces on it and whatnot. So it, it it's uh, in one way, it management intensive grazing told us we really needed a drought plan, but drought is actually what threw us into the management intensive grazing. So that we could manage and manage for it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, so you knew your numbers. You know roughly the dry matter intake of each cow. Right. Then, when you started measuring your forage production, you knew what was there. Yep. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later in a different question about about what you wanted to maybe leave behind. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, you had information to make decisions with. Oh, because definitely. Because you had built a plan. Yeah even if you didn't intend to when the drought started. <laughs> right. Well, and it, yeah, because it's, yeah, it all comes together as a forage grazing plan. Mm -hmm. And so it's, and if you know what's there, then you know how much you've got to budget and allocate and, you know, and what you need to leave behind and mm -hmm. whatnot. So, yeah, it tells you how many cows you can run. So, you know. 
So a lot of us are looking in the mirror and asking ourselves what's the most important. Uh, we may be facing the decision of, of maybe further destocking or, or starting to market some animals that are on the ranch and that wouldn't be limited to you know, most of Western South Dakota's biz beef ranches, right? Cow-calf producers maybe bring in some yearlings or something like that. Um, but I think it would be important, Bart, if you would share with us uh, the priority in which you rank ranch resources, such as uh, the ranch, the land itself, the livestock that are on it, family, the grass that you grow on an annual basis, and of course that's variable given mm -hmm. the weather, um, but also variable based on the previous year's management and possibly even longer ahead of that. Right. Um, and we know that things like soil health improve over time, just like degradation occurs over, over time. time. So, um, yeah, take it away. Yeah. So, yeah, we, uh, we would prioritize ranch resources the same we do the rest of the things in our life. Uh, you know, God, family, uh, God first, and then our family second after that, and then the land, then the grass, and the cattle. And a lot of us get wrapped up with our our livestock is our identity, you know, and and they're really pretty far down the list because they are replaceable. We're a seed stock operation, and we've sold half our cows in the last year to because of drought, you know, and preparing for it and dealing with it, and so the in yourself, you know, it's got to be up there towards the top too because because of that. So, you know, your family is always going to be there for you and and then your land's going to be there and if you take care of that land it'll take care of you and you know build that soil and build the next crop to come so mm -hmm. you said something there bart i don't know if you meant to but but you said and yourself yeah taking care of yourselves uh folks if you're if you're struggling with the decisions that you're facing right now um, we want you to know that there will be some resources some links available so if a lot of the livestock, the, the, the animals that cause us to have annual income have already gone to town and we maybe are, are planning ahead and saving those dollars so that we can get back in when conditions improve are gone, uh, how do you diversify the operational income on this, on this ranch? Well, we've had, and I've always, I've had job before, you know, working for the farm service agency and stuff like that. So you can have off farm off ranch income. My wife has a catering business. Uh, but a lot of that to protect your profitability is is when you need to to go ahead and, and pull the trigger to get rid of them cows because it could end up costing you way more to keep them and you lose all your profitability and you end up with nothing where if you if you do sell your cows you know if that I mean it becomes an option that not only is that money sitting there, but you're also saving money on the other end of not trying to replace forage, you mm -hmm. know, that, that grows for free. So, so there's, there's just little things like that. And, um, you know, and, and one thing about it, I look at drought as a way to make my ranch better and not many people look at it that way, but it, uh, I, I learned to improve my management skills. I've learned to improve my herd through it, you know, to get rid of the bottom end and things like that. So, mm -hmm. so there's, there's those things that help and increase your profitability once it's in place that mm -hmm. makes things better, you know, and it, it's hard to look at drought as making things better, but that's mm -hmm. how we try to have the outlook on it. Sometimes the hardest times come with the biggest lessons, right? Yeah, true. Yeah. And sometimes the smallest degree of change can make the biggest difference. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Yep. So. Bart, how do you make decisions in an environment where you do not know the future, such as the weather or life in general? Um, all you can operate from is, is the past. In, in my, I thought about that one quite a bit. It's it's because you make the decisions on what you know now. You know, uh, we try not to look into the past too much. We try to learn lessons, you know, like what they say if you... You know, those who forget the past are bound to repeat it. Mm -hmm. So, so we try to learn lessons from them past. But right now, how we make decisions is <clears throat> is what we know right now. Um, 
and and we do also use you know we use like the the drought tool you know mm -hmm. looking forward a little bit and knowing what them past records were like he's talking about 2019 you know we run out of that moisture in, in june of 2020 mm -hmm. you know you can tell it and so now we're going to have the same lasting probably even more lasting coming out of this drought if it goes to raining because you know like last fall you we had had some moisture and some some places got to hold it some haven't um like here at home we do have some subsoil moisture um but going forward now is how we you know we do a, an assessment of our grass in march before the growing season we do an assessment of our grass in the end of october early november at the end of our growing season so that way we're always looking ahead of what we have in front of us and that's that's what we base our a lot of decisions on is what we have mm -hmm. along with our trigger dates and our drought plan you know and so even if we have the forge there if we don't have <clears throat> substantial or average moisture up to that point then then it kicks in our our first step you know mm -hmm. our drought plan so You mentioned it previously, Bart, but it's worth mentioning again uh, because I, I haven't heard it spoken about as much as probably should be amongst the ranching community. And, and the question is, what minimum amount of surface protection or plant litter do you strive to maintain after a grazing event? I wouldn't, I, uh, I struggle to even say aim for because we I mean it's it's more than a goal it's like a rule that, that we leave at least 800 pounds per acre of residue mm -hmm. plant residue behind to protect the soil and and a lot of times we try to leave more than that you know depending on the situation or whatever but as just as a rule we leave 800 pounds you know, so it's uh, at a minimum I mean it's and that's where talk about minimums but then aiming for it it's like and and but it that takes a lot of practice because you, you need to clip and weigh grass and and assess and know what what is actually there you know thank you for mentioning that i was going to ask you how do you know how do you measure yeah you measure <laughs> yeah uh hoop which i think get at grazing school i don't know if we can get it anywhere else we can probably get it from you guys at the probably. nrcs but uh, i know a guy here's a here's a plug <laughs> for the grazing school if you go to grazing school you'll get the kit uh, you know, and, and you'll learn how to do it there too. So it's, uh, but yeah, measure, weigh and measure, weigh and measure. And it, and it takes a long time. Now that I've done it a bunch, so you, you pretty well know when you're looking at it, but, but we, I still do it, you know, and mm -hmm. still throw my hoop out and gather up and weigh, weigh what's left. I and, suppose at least a few pastures. Oh yeah. You know, and yeah. maybe your eyes calibrated yeah. after that because yeah. you have experience. Yeah. With it. Yeah. yeah. And you'll, you'll find that even folks that do range management consulting on, on a full-time basis still do clip and weigh. Um, and it's not just a green weight. It's a, a dare dry weight. A dare dry weight, yep. Because that is the basis of stocking rate calculations because we consider the dry weight for yep. the intake on, on any class of livestock and their weight. Yep. So leaving behind no less than 800 pounds, and in some cases 12, 14, 1500 pounds per acre of, of dried grass behind to protect the soil, by some might be viewed as wasted grass. Mm -hmm. So what benefits does this wasted grass provide in terms of building soil resilience? Oh man, it's like a Pandora's box, really. But it's first and foremost it gives a place for that raindrop to hit like you said not just hit cap soil or cap the soil mm -hmm. hit bare ground it gives us a spot to slow that water down and getting in contact then it's you know it's feeding the microbes and everything else that's in the soil it starts building up turning in and then starts turning into organic matter once it starts breaking down and so it's you know it's it's one thing i thought about this was like an envelope you know it's like and it's kind of a pandora's box deal but you think you're just leaving this much behind but the benefit of it opens up to everything underneath the soil you know it's there's 
a lot more lives under the soil than there are on top of the soil. So it's we got to feed them too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's said, and when we do classroom visits and talk about soil and soil health and function, uh, one of the things we share with those students is that uh, in one teaspoon of soil there are more living organisms than there are people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, the world population is growing, but hopefully if we're managing for healthy soil, we can still say that because there's going to be more and more organisms in that same volume. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it works as a, a blanket in the wintertime, an umbrella in the summer. Too, yeah, right? that's right, yeah. Uh, soil temperature, that's huge. That's, you know, <clears throat> covering that soil in the summertime, you know, keeping that sun from hitting it and, and killing the microbes i don't even remember the temperatures now but and then in the winter time you know it <clears throat> it is that insulating factor and if you cover it up with snow <clears throat> it's even better because mm -hmm. then it's it's almost like a greenhouse underneath there you yeah. know yeah how yeah. many times have you seen a snowbank melt away to find vibrant green grass yeah. that yeah. has come um, yeah. those those very early season grasses and a lot of times they might be tame grasses crested wheat grass yeah. Some, yeah. Brome or kentucky bluegrass which maybe aren't desired across the landscape but they certainly hold a place oh yeah yeah so. so we've talked about having a plan and implementing it when the signs of drought were, were starting to show up what do we expect of the land managed in this way a plan implemented before we were in crisis mode as far as response time when favorable you know it rains mm -hmm. what now it's going to be it's going to be faster you know than typical long term or season long grazing or something like that it's and you know like the immediate response we have seen that actually because in the drought 2012 it didn't rain and we managed through but uh your the manure and urine load is concentrated you know <clears throat> and urine is instantly responsive to moisture and it's immediately available to the roots of the zone <clears throat> but uh the land that's managed this way it has the root reserve still down there you know because it's given time to rest and recover totally without being trying to grow back and get nipped off again dying off and there is one probably one benefit to look forward to is <clears throat> on some of these places looking around that that w are really hurting is some of that grass went dormant mm. and so thankfully it wasn't grazed again mm -hmm. you know uh, it didn't didn't try to grow back you know so there is there's you know native prairie is resilient and, it, and, it, and when taken care of it, it will respond a lot faster mm -hmm. you know so it's but I know like our grass has, it has deep roots and I know we have different root zones from the diversity out there, you know, the different plant species that complement each other. And so it, it's gonna respond a lot faster. Yeah, there's, uh, we haven't mentioned it here yet, but uh, now is as good a time as any. You know, we, we recognize that there's, there's five main principles of soil health. Uh, first and foremost, just keep the soil covered. Bart's talked about mm -hmm. that and maintaining that residue cover. Uh, number two is, in the case of grazing lands, to optimize disturbance because grazing is a disturbance to the landscape, okay. right? Um, Bart talked about not regrazing because uh, it would just be like a, a, those of you in sports, if you like to watch boxing or, or mixed martial arts, it would, it would, being regrazed to a plant would be like that, that boxer. Um, having having one match and then turning around two hours later and fighting another one <laughs> there isn't adequate time to recover they're probably going to get smoked unless they're a super athlete we have some super plants here in the northern great plains but they aren't capable of, of taking grazing operation after grazing operation in the same growing season um, so that rest and recovery is important bart mentioned diversity that's huge uh, we've got four main plant types throughout the world cool season grasses and cool season broadleaves, warm season grasses, and warm season broadleaves. And all that those terms mean is, is that we've got leafy plants like, like grasses that have long leaves uh, versus broadleaves such as alfalfa or sunflowers or, or things like that. Um, we've got the legumes that in all native 
uh, in our context here, but, but the principles apply to tame grasses mm -hmm. as well or tame pastures as well. What we take for granted on, on grazing land here in South Dakota is that the livestock are incorporated. They're an important tool when managed correctly. And, and Bart spoke about how they take their place in priority order as far as resources on the mm -hmm. ranch. It's a, it, they're viewed as a tool, even though they're what we recognize cash for when right. we go to market. Yeah. So we've mentioned some important dates here on, on Bart and Shannon's place. And, and I'm curious, Bart, if you can explain how important planning the annual grazing rotation really is here and, and what that means for you as far as results. Well, it's <laughs> how important it is it? It's, as the commercial says, priceless. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, you know, it's, it's what we have. And so like planning our whole deal, you know, we're, we're planning a, a year round grazing system and <clears throat> not everybody's going to do that, mm -hmm. you know, but, but you need to know what you have. And, you know, it kind of come to a conclusion for me here a while back that, you know, was thinking about it and should we sell, should we not? Well, <clears throat> we set them dates and that helps take the emotion out. You know, it's, it, it becomes a business strategy then and we're protecting that resource. Mm -hmm. And like we talked about earlier, the, the grass comes above the cattle and the, actually the land comes above the grass. So, I mean, it's what we got to do to protect them resources. And, and that comes all the way down to protecting our family because I get stressed and emotional at, at a point. So planning that out a year ahead, we have we have the strategy ahead of us and we can see that as a goal, you know, and what we have. And you know, maybe we're not gonna make it to the whole year, but we're gonna plan that forage out and then and then the the weather, you know, a lot of times when I say the weather dictates that I'm talking about covering up icing up you know, mm. and not being able to graze. Yeah, it. the physical activity the, of grazing the, is yeah, not possible. Right, because it's not possible. Four feet deep. Right, yeah. so and now, <laughs> now in this situation, like this year now, <clears throat> you know, in the last month, we've been, we're losing some ground cover and grass breaking off to wind, mm -hmm. you know. So, <clears throat> but, so the, we need to pay attention to that and, uh, we don't want to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, put them decisions off until it's too late. And, you know, right now, the way up market is pretty good. And, and we're like, oh, way up market. And, but, you know, a lot of times in these situations, it's not. So if we don't make that decision early on and go ahead with it, it you know, what if, what if we got in the middle of summer and we had to dispose of our herd? You know that's that's pretty heartening disheartening mm -hmm. and so you know if we if we make them decisions early and pull the trigger on them I've, I've never heard talk to anybody that has regretted it I know one guy that fully liquidated a, year, a little over a year ago mm -hmm. you know and he is so thankful he did you know because their conditions just keep getting drier and drier and and everybody's situation is going to be different you know you know, you planning it out, you know, I, just recently I spent several hours reconciling my checkbook register uh, because I'd gotten lazy and I hadn't done it. Mm -hmm. uh, there for a while, my family's expenses went without being checked. Thankfully, we didn't get into a crisis situation because we were pretty modest about our spending during that time frame where it wasn't being reconciled. But you talking about planning out your annual grazing is really no different than that. that that's a great example because yeah it's like when i mentioned the savings account you know mm -hmm. it's if if we can build it build it up you know and protect it you yeah. know that's that's a great analogy yeah. Yeah. so your forecast on the end of march mm -hmm. probably does it always presume normal conditions or, or are you kind of watching the trend the trend uh we're looking at the trend not presuming normal so then we're going to base that off uh we stock two to our available forage mm -hmm. at this point, and then what we have today. What we have today. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, and then we use uh, the drought tool, and then and then predict okay. below average. 
because it is below average, you know, we can't expect it to really just all of a sudden turn around. It could happen, could. and we're thankful for it. Mm -hmm. But but we're going to presume we stay in the same thing. So then, And then I base, uh, I kind of compare them to, and if, if I'm one way or the other, it's best to go to the safe mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. you know. Um, this spring, we come down to, uh, well, last fall, we were looking at, 33 percent reduction so then the cows actually left for 110 days to corn stalks well that's almost 30 percent of the year mm -hmm. so that was kind of our budget at that time mm -hmm. come to march now um we're looking at a 50 percent destock which compared to the drought tool said 46 so we're pretty comparable in there mm -hmm. you know so, and for this location, it wasn't just yeah, that, that was place yeah, in that was Dakota, that yeah. was for this location, mm -hmm. and so we but we'd already de already destocked last fall, and then then sent the cows away. Off the number we had, then we needed another thirty percent. So that's where the hundred ten days come from, sure. and so then and now we have very few this spring that we had to sell because we're ahead of it, mm -hmm. you know, coming into it. Very good, very good. And you're speaking alternatives there you could, you could have sold 30 percent of the cow herd but instead yeah. they left the whole cow herd left for 30 percent of the yeah, year right uh, so responding to conditions early leaves you alternatives yeah it, oh, it definitely you don't want to be backed in the corner and then there's only one way out you know so mm -hmm. we'll talk more at length about if you find yourself in the corner mm -hmm. and and now you have to make hard decisions and emotional decisions and costly decisions and and uh, maybe some ways that you can weigh those factors and, and make a wise business decision uh, at least as wise as you can given the circumstances this is pretty serious content and and uh, you know, we're talking business and, and lasting decisions or impacts on, on family operations across the state. Um, and, and certainly some folks are going to use this opportunity or this, I, I'm seeing it from the positive light when I say the word opportunity, but some folks will use this period of drought to enhance their ability to, to better withstand the next one by installing additional livestock watering facilities on their ranches. Um, just curious, what role do water developments play here? They're big. As last fall, you know, I was telling this is this shortage of grass is actually NRCS's fault. Yeah, because <laughs> because now I have water. <laughs> if, no, and and it's it's good, but it's it's really not their fault. But it's a great tool, all in water. You know, we have water tanks. But the truth is, if it wasn't for that water development, we wouldn't have had a cow here last summer because the dams were all dry and so but through equip and different different things programs you know we have water now water tanks in every pasture mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> but that that also just increases the level of potential that we need to be paying attention to our drought management mm -hmm. because now cattle can be there where in the past they wouldn't have been because of lack of water so, but now, you know, we're in the middle of uh, expanding our water development so we can get better utilization to the backs of the pastures and stuff like that and, and increasing. And so that, w that water development, having that water available to the livestock is unmeasurable, you know. And, and, I, and I say that as a joke that it was NRCS's fault. Of but course. It's, uh, but it is a great tool. And, you know, that's where it's, when I come to the realization of that, that we wouldn't have any cattle here if it wasn't for that developed water. It was pretty big. So with piped water and tanks in every pasture, does the rotation last year, is it going to look the same this year? No, our, our rotation is offset. I mean, and, you know, I hear different things of starting where you left or going backwards or something like that. And, and, I, and I never really hold to that because I, I just don't I don't want to ever give anything a shorter rest period so so our we we plan out for 14 months to graze and sometimes that speeds up sometimes it slows down depends on what happens but 
but as long as the, I'm off, then the next year coming around, hopefully that it had 14 months off, but maybe it, maybe it only had 11 or something. But it, but it's not being grazed less than that, you know, or getting hammered again when it's just trying to regrow. So it's and then that way, our system is always off from the year before, and so it's a little bit. I would say slow to change, but very slow to return back to that spot. So um, I had figured up here one time on a pasture here the last time it was, we were there in May and everybody was here. And the last time was it was grazed in May, let alone early May or late May, it was like nine years. Mm. So so we just keep our rotation offset a little bit. So it's never the, hitting the same spot the same time of year. The importance of that, of course, goes back to, remember, we have cool and warm season, both grasses and broad leaves, and every plant has its growth window, basically, or its growing season, mm -hmm. and, and to not compound the effects of always being in the same pasture on the same date, uh, what that does over time is actually cause a shift in plant community, right? We're right. going to probably get replaced with less desirable, less productive plants if we continue to do the same thing. And year less year. diversity, right. what I've really noticed, because if we hit a different time of year, we graze something different, you know, but but in our management, we try to graze every everything, so, so we get our stock density up so that they'll graze everything, and then, but something else has an advantage at any time of the year, different right. time of the year. Right. Yeah. The way you manage your livestock while in pasture kind of takes away some of their natural selectivity Selection. Yep. Yeah. Uh, as far as what plants they eat because of the uh, almost a competitive eating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, if we were all turned into the, you know, salad bar at the same time, you know, uh, we'd take whatever we could get in front of. If I just go up there by myself, I'm going to take pudding, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe no lettuce, but if, if there's a whole bunch of us and we know that's all we're going to get, we'll probably take some lettuce, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Or at least something that'll last yeah. for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something not as, not your favorite anyway. Right. So. They look a lot different, but cows are a lot like people. Oh, yeah, yeah. they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get in trouble about that all the time, comparing people to the cows. <laughs> <laughs> we better leave it there. <laughs> yeah. We touched a little bit on this earlier, but, but it's worthy of being mentioned again. Because we recognize the emotional and financial toll um, that that drought can put operations in. Um, it's not just the day-to-day -day manager who's making most of the decisions, but it's their family members, um, it's their business partners. If if the business is structured that way, it's it's any number of things. So, in times of stress, how valuable are your personal and business relationships in a time like this? Oh man, it's <laughs> totally, they're really valuable and, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I mean, it's kind of a confession video, but like, <laughs> uh, keeping communications open. I mean, it's really, really important because, you know, and whether you think you're alone or not, you're, you're not, you have a business partner and your spouse or, you know, or, a, or a dad or son or something. So you need to keep them, uh lines of communication open and like you know I just visited with my landlord a landlord the other morning you know about the conditions and and how many cows he expects me to run and whatnot you know and I mean and knowing that things are tough and knowing he's looking for a check and but just keeping them communications open and visiting with each other and and the more you do that in good times is important too because then you learn to communicate with each other and how each other communicates, you know, and because uh, if you only go in times of trouble, it, then it's really hard to communicate. So, um, and like I said, I, I'm terrible about it. So I'm kind of learning how to do that better uh, and keep communications open with even my wife and, and, and children, you know, and so it's what's going on, what's happening, why it's happening. And so, you know. So stay tuned to this website for additional resources. Uh, if, if you're in a situation where you don't feel like you can or should talk to those very close people, uh, whether they're personal or business, um, yeah. you just need to unload some things. Uh, the 
resources will be here on sddroughtplan.org. Yeah, call one of us. Or us, certainly. <laughs> So we've talked and danced around the, the content or, or pieces of grazing and drought plan already, but uh, it kind of to sum it up, what's the lasting value of having a grazing management plan uh, that incorporates drought contingency in it? Lasting is the word. I mean, it's generational. It's, you know, without one, you're, you're kind of doing... I mentioned earlier about managing for what you know now, you know, and but having that plan out ahead of you so that you can manage in in all planning, you know, even family planning or whatever, uh, that grazing plan. How you know they say planned grazing is destined to fail, but a grazing plan is the road to success, you know, mm. and so. And, and thinking of the planned grazing is because then it's a recipe and you're in this spot at this time and out at this spot. Well, in, in, with a grazing plan, you need to be, learn to be adaptable too. You know, when something, something comes through, if fire comes through that spot, you can't just leave your cows there because that's the way the plan is. Right. You know, so a, a guy's got to learn to roll with it. But, but, you know, the General MacArthur talked about the plan, you know, World War II, I believe. I can't remember. But, you know, not planning is pl a plan to fail. I really believe that, you know, and you've got to have that set before you. And it's lasting value. The way you said that is, uh, I'm thinking it's generational. It's, you know, and you build that soil and that grass and it's there to take care of you. And, you know, if if you don't take care of that, you don't have anything. And if you don't have a plan, you're not taking care of it, you know. Yeah, that's right. And, and ultimately, if we're as hard as it can be, especially when, when forage production is low, leaving behind enough to protect the soil and, and actually infiltrate more water more rapidly mm -hmm. than, than just taking it for what it's worth. Right. You know, just trying to survive. Um, and I know that's a situation that we all find ourselves in. Gosh, maybe we need to dig a little deeper, and and that's maybe you've made that decision already, and the, the, it's done. Well, moving forward, we're encouraging you to to put together a plan. So yeah. If if you're already here in 22, we record this on the 7th of April. Um, you might not watch it until May or June, and the conditions hopefully are good, but they might be worse. Mm -hmm. And so, what better time to to plan ahead? because you know, drought's going to return. Oh, yeah. It might not be this bad, it might be worse, but having both business affairs, grazing plans, and relationships in a healthy state when that time comes, uh, Bart talked about communicating. Mm -hmm. um, there's other stakeholders in your operation, even if you're a sole proprietor. You know, if you're yeah. married, you have a business partner, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, um, yeah, what did they say? Uh, best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Next. Mm -hmm best time is today and that's the way the grazing plan is too it's, and and when i'm thinking of a grazing plan it, it includes the drought plan you know it's they are one in the same they and should the same. be one yeah in the it's, same. it's a forage plan you know so you know bart mentioned the the drought tool and that is a resource that south dakota nrcs has incorporated on its website uh, easy enough to find just go do a search for sd nrcs and uh under pasture and range resources, you can find the drought tool. It does require internet access to, to actively run because it pulls precipitation records from your county and, and a listing of, of stations that are available in each county. Uh, it does also have the ability for those of you that track your own precipitation to enter your own data, which would overwrite that nearest station that, that you've selected. And, and you can write some drought planning on there. Yep, yep. So. It, it generates a, a report where you can just type it right out. These are the things that we're going to do um, either mm -hmm. at this date or, or in this order at the very least. And, and that's a starting point. Bart, is your drought plan the same now as when you first put it together? No, I was just going to say that too. It's, yeah, don't, don't think you have to have it correct the first time, mm -hmm. you know, but, but just starting to implement that and, and put them thoughts into word starts making the plan together. So.
Bart, Bart talked about the marketing plan. Um, you might find yourself making decisions at a time when normally less valuable animals are worth more than they typically should be, and that might change for that implementation mm -hmm. strategy. It might change the way you market different classes of, of livestock. In yeah, in what classes? You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you want to get in that, but sure. <laughs> uh, Go on. well, you know, like when a guy's figuring what what to destock with is figuring out what is your most profitable animal, you know, first and foremost. Now, a lot of times we think it's our cows, them are what we want to hang on to, but sometimes they're not the most profitable or highest gross margin. So that's where we base a lot of them decisions too, you know, is, mm -hmm. to, is to run different analysis on different animals uh, mm -hmm. to see which ones are making us the most money and which ones are paying for the most for their feed in times like this. Bart, you mentioned trigger dates and, and your drought plan, and I wanted you to explain a little deeper for folks that maybe don't have a drought plan um, or are simply recognizing the con conditions today and, and going about life day by day. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like there's more to it here, and, and I'd like to understand a little more. Well, I don't know if there's more to it. We've kind of simplified it after several years, but it was... We used to do percentages of moisture, you know, different things like that, which would be our triggers. And now our, uh, we have three trigger dates a year, which is October 15th, March 25th, and April 28th, It's or May 28th, sorry, it's Memorial Day, we use as our trigger dates. And uh, <clears throat> so whatever, what we've been using the last several years, and it seems to work well, is is if we are below normal, say in the fall of October 15th, moisture level, we, we, re we, we stock to the resource we have available in front of us prorated out for the next six months. So then when we get to March 25th, that's, that's really a, a big one for us. It's because it depends on the, the winter moisture, stuff like that, a little bit of spring moisture just getting started and, and then that is a major uh, point for us the March 25th because we go uh, we will totally reduce or stock to the only the forage that is standing in front of us for the next 12 months and so and really the Memorial Day weekend one it's usually a, a rainy weekend for us that's kind of our typical so mm -hmm. It, you know, it's kind of one of them old adages where it, if it rains Memorial Day, you know, you'll have grass. Well, that's not always true, but it's it kind of gives us a little bit of an inkling. We don't really adjust too much by that time because hopefully we've already implemented them steps to, that have already taken place by that time, you know. Yeah, you were looking last fall yeah. ahead to what you were going to overwinter. Yep. And in early spring in the yeah, march yep yeah. um, and then we pro and then we plan out for the whole next year on the available forage we have you at said that something point. that stuck to me there forage standing yeah sometimes grass is laying on the ground some well and, sometimes and, and, it is yeah and particularly it's, in the way that you graze in a management intensive deal where there's a lot of of uh, the stock density right putting vegetation in contact with the ground but then we don't want to steal that away from the land so that's what that that ground that grass that is down and flat against the soil it belongs to the soil so we don't want to take that off and you know we have um, in a situation like this we'll probably graze it a little deeper <clears throat> our goal is usually always our, our goal used to be 800 pounds an acre left behind um, there was ground that wouldn't grow 800 pounds an acre so we were we were managing around that and pretty lightly grazing it. Now, pretty much everywhere, we can always leave 800 pounds behind. Um, but our goal is a lot of times 1,000 pounds, sometimes even 1,200 pounds left behind because then we can start building soil. And so we get in a situation uh, like this drought, and as long as we're leaving that 800 pounds, we know we're protecting the soil and leaving cover on it. And, and we're not building soil, but we're protecting soil. So, and protecting that health. And so that's where we, 
do that assessment and we don't want to count any old litter or nothing it's got to be standing that way we get an assessment of what we can grease if nothing changed you know and part of it is you will get rain you know um but a lot of times what i've found in the soil once that soil starts working well it starts eating that stuff you know so a lot of times what we grow we start losing in old you know it start and it's cycling so mm -hmm. that's kind of where we base our our year plan on that march assessment because and if we get more moisture in that we're growing more grass that's a bonus for us it's like a savings account for us you know so it's it's not going anywhere it's there you, you just said sold stole the words right out of my mouth i was thinking about that that plant residue that's in contact with the ground horizontal not a, not attached as an upright stem anymore as a savings account that's <laughs> that's what will buffer the impact of a raindrop when it hits the ground and prevent soil erosion uh, but it also enhances water infiltration so mm -hmm. if we catch that three inch rain that comes hard yeah you've got a, a almost a blanket or sponge there to to soften that impact and get that water into the soil oh yeah totally we had but, springs open up this spring so you wow. know it's, it's pretty neat for the infiltration to start working like that yeah and, and by comparison if if it's exposed soil in between plant crowns you're very subject to runoff um, you'll catch some yeah the soil is going to absorb some but that three inch rain you might lose two-thirds or even three-fourths of it if it's coming hard and fast of on unprotected soil oh yeah yeah bart said something there that that uh, i think is worthy of inserting this little little note in and that's uh for folks that are facing emotional stress right now maybe some kind of depression and things if you're not feeling comfortable visiting with a, a member of your local church or your family or a friend or something like that, you may need to unload some things. Um, just talk it out. Um, and, and we want you to know that those resources are made available on the very same website that you found this video on. And that would could be found either through sdgrass.org, which is the Grassland Coalition's website, or sddroughtplan.org, which is... Uh, created specifically uh, to hold resources for folks that are dealing with drought conditions. So the trigger dates have happened and whether it's March 25th or Memorial weekend, you recognize that the conditions are such that you're overstocked and something needs to leave. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean it has to be sold. It just has to leave right. as we discussed yeah. earlier. So uh, how do you make those decisions? Bart? So we have, a strategy we, we use what we call ABC herd and and that's even changed in my mind from where it was but you could do this two different ways there's if, if you only have mother cows you know have them broke up into a B and C herd you know and and some people that's as simple as uh, yearling heifers or something you know um, and in my case it's it's cows that we've noticed something about you know uh, so, and once, once C herd leaves, there's a new one made. B becomes C, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of a roll down effect. But now there's another way to think of that too. Like if you have different enterprises, say in yearlings or uh, yearling heifers or yearling steers or cows or custom grazers, um, A, B, and C herds should be the, the herds that have the highest gross margin, the most profitable herd that you that would pay for them, pay for their feed the easiest or or have the opportunity to come back from the most profitable, you know, so. So everybody kind of needs to differentiate how they do that, but um, I like the ABC herds because when we decide, say, in October of last year. We decide C herd needs to go. And, and based on that, how big C herd is, there's a little bit too on what, you know, uh, what that stocking rate is. Well then, <clears throat> like I said, then as soon as C herd was gone, B herd becomes C herd. Mm -hmm. you or, know, or B herd gets divided into two groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or you could split it, yeah. And so then, now when we come down to this spring of March 25th, you know, um, we're into our second step really which could mean you could just call it b2 if you wanted to but 
but I, I always say C because C is cool and it's easy to mm. cool. Mm -hmm. And so once you put them in there, it kind of helps take that emotion away from it because now she's a cold cow and I'm running her, you know, well, if things get tougher, C herd's going to go. And mm -hmm. you've already kind of mentally made up your mind before you just had to just pull the trigger and sell her. Good. So that, that's good. I like that approach because we do, we, we learn to love caring for those animals, right? Oh, we do. Yeah. 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 And our identity gets wrapped up in them, and, and we get married to them. They say, "Don't get married to your cow." So if you if you can put her in the cool herd, you're not married to her no more. So uh, yeah. you've had a fight. Yeah, you've had <laughs> <laughs> maybe a maybe more multiple. Than that. Yeah, yeah. And and it's not either of your faults, but uh, you know, the conditions were such that that you needed to part ways. Yeah, and you know, and we get a lot of people hang on their cow herd, you know, uh, and maybe have some yearlings or even custom cattle they're grazing um and a lot of times they let them go first but they might be the higher grossing mm -hmm. animals so maybe they should stay they should come in anyway and the cow herd should leave so i mean and everybody's situation is going to be different on that depending on their operating style and input cost and so 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 if i'm hearing your summary there correctly it's not only that we need to know the capability of our land to produce but we need to really know our financial assessment as well yeah very uh, much so yeah and, well, that's a lot of our decisions are based on that mm -hmm. just as much you know mm -hmm. yep yes this is lifestyle and there's no better place to be and raise a family than in ranch country that said though it's still a business it is still a business and and the uh, I, I just told Buzz yesterday, you know, there's, he goes, you like to do math, you know, to figure <laughs> out them numbers. And I'm like, the thing is, every ranch owner is a CEO of a multi-million dollar business, and we need to treat it that way. Yep, yep. It's often overlooked. Yeah. Um, but, but definitely true. Yeah. You don't believe it? We own three tractors, go price three brand new tractors. <laughs> yeah. You know, or three brand new pickups or whatever. Yeah. Or fill them all with fuel. <laughs> or just the value of your land. I mean, yeah. that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for your time, Bart. And uh, folks, you can always reach out to uh, a group that we have not mentioned yet in this series of questions, uh, but it bears repeating from others, and that is the, the Mentor Network. Um, you'll find Bart's name on there and contact information. Uh, that is a publication that a host of conservation partners in South Dakota uh, went together and, and solicited some, some folks that have experience. So if you're new to ranching and are facing this struggle for the very first time, uh, you're likely to make some mistakes and why not have a sounding board or two or five? And these folks have volunteered to be part of that network and, and really do want your call and want to walk with you through. And have probably problems. made the mistakes before you did. So, mm -hmm. you know, I yeah. mean, that's you, one thing. We always try to learn from each other's mistakes and try to help. Yep. That will make hard decisions easy, but the, you might be able to make them from a more informed position um, by, by walking in somebody else's shoes for just, just a phone call or a mm -hmm. personal visit.